approximately 0.6, 0.9% difference. Okay. So that's an argument from homology coupled with an underlying argument of redundancy in the code. But I personally don't feel those to be the most compelling arguments for human chimpanzee common ancestry, compelling as they, as they are. One thing that is, I, in my view, and again, these are not separate lines of evidence. They all converge and support one another. What I find quite interesting and convincing is this issue of syntony. And this is something that's not as well known in this, in this uh, origins discussion among Christians, primarily because it hasn't been picked up as a rhetorical tool, either for or against by either side. But I think there's something here that we could look at and learn from. Okay, so what do we mean by syntony? I'm a Drosophila geneticist and cell biologist, and part of what we do in our work, looking at the chromosomes of flies, is that you can tell in different isolates from different populations, perhaps, that chromosomal information, genes in an order, have been rearranged in some way. There's evidence that events such as translocations of information from one site to another, inversions of a section of a chromosome, perhaps, have occurred. And the evidence for that type of event is conservation of spatial information. Basically, we have the same genes in the same order, but it's been rearranged in some way. The evidence is, well, we see the same genes. They're backwards in this section. We can explain this by a breakage and an inversion event, for example. Now, you can apply this same logic to look at gene order in blocks between different species. And flies are actually an excellent resource for this because we now have the sequence, the complete sequence, genome sequence for many different species of fruit flies. So between closely related species, we can begin to investigate these issues as well. Here are just two references that I'm going to draw my next few figures from discussing this type of thing. So what you see on the right is a, homol or a, a phylogeny of different drosophilid species. Here's what their karyotypes look like. So this is a pictorial representation of their chromosome complement. And the color coding is highlighting what are called Mueller elements. So this is blocks of DNA that are syntonous with one another. They retain the same information in the same order, generally speaking but they are found in different chromosomal arrangements in these different species. You can also see that there's evidence for fusion events, for breakage events, for large-scale inversions, and that sort of thing when you look between the different species. Okay, here's just a graphical represent representation of this between a number of different species. What you see when a line goes straight across is that you've got the same genes in exactly the same order. These little lines indicate genes, sections of DNA, and where they are in this, in, uh, where their corresponding location is in different genomes. What you can see, for example, with Drosophila melanogaster at the top and with Drosophila erecta just below, is that there is a large amount of conservation of syntony between these different organisms. With a few exceptions, you can see with those sort of constrictions, that's a large-scale inversion where there's something that's just flipped over and now everything's in an, a different orientation. And But for the most part, you can see that there's high correspondence. Large blocks of genes are present at the same, in the same spatial orientation. And then the farther down you go, you can see it becomes more different because we're presumably talking about more distant speciation events. So what you can do with this type of analysis is you can actually count how many genes come in a block. How many genes are there in a block of syntony that you can compare between these two different organisms. And what you do, or what can be done, is you can plot the number of blocks of different sizes as a function of presumed time since divergence. So what we see here is for these species, this is comparing it to Drosophila melanogaster, these two other species presumed to be quite close relatives of Drosophila melanogaster. And what you can see is there's still very large blocks of syntony up to the order of, say, 1,500 genes, there's a number there, and then down to blocks that only conserve, say, two genes together. And what we see is when we look at other species presumed to have been more distantly related, speciated at an earlier time, based on other criteria, molecular clocks and such, what you can see is that the farther away you get from Drosophila melanogaster, presumably in time, these blocks of syntony on average become smaller, presumably reflecting recombination, breakage and rejoining, and reshuffling of these large blocks into smaller blocks over time. Now again, 
This is a prediction that's made on molecular clocks of individual genes that don't, does not presume for this particular phylogeny based on this data. So this is a prediction that is supported. Okay. People don't really care about fruit fly evolution. <laughs> the individuals at your church do not lie awake at night contemplating if Drosophila pseudo-obscura is related to Drosophila melanogaster. That's just not an issue. As a geneticist, I feel that perhaps it should be an issue, but... <laughs> but where the rubber meets the road, as you well know, is this issue of human common ancestry with other forms of life, specifically other great apes. So the question then becomes, okay, now that you've learned a little bit about what syntony is, and you have an appreciation for the homology argument in terms of the identity over a vast swath of the genome, the question then becomes, well, do we have the same genes in the same order? How do we look in terms of a syntony arrangement between humans and other forms of life, say gorillas or chimpanzees? So this is a comparison between human chromosomes and chimpanzee chromosomes. You have the human chromosome on the left. You have the chimpanzee equivalent on the right. And this is just based on a low-level DNA stain, just to give a graphic representation of what these chromosomes look like. This was done back in the 80s, and you can see that there's quite a striking correspondence between the two sets. The most notable difference, as you're probably aware, is the human chromosome 2 issue, which you can, you can see there over on the left where what we see as one chromosome in humans is present as syntonous groups of those genes on those two chromosome arms in humans are present on two separate chromosomes in chimps and also in gorillas. So the question then becomes, in that specific instance, okay, most of the rest, this is just a subset, but most of the rest of the genome is aligned quite closely. What we're looking at here is something that's more similar to closely related Drosophila species as opposed to rapidly or widely divergent Drosophila species. Okay, let's have a little bit of a look at this chromosome 2 issue because it's something that I think you can't really have a talk about this without touching on that one, right? So here's a closer look at the syntony argument for this region. We're looking at human chromosome 2 and we've got comparisons between chromosome, a couple of chromosomes in chimpanzee on the next one over and gorilla as well. And what you can't quite see from the distance is there's all these lines indicating where the relative genes are between these two organisms. And what you see, of course, is that they're in the same relative locations with a few exceptions that can be explained in terms of inversions. Or in this one case, this fusion, this telomeric end-to-end -end fusion of chromosomes, presumably. If we have a closer look at this little area right here, just so you can see it, what we see, and this um, points to the next portion of the talk of talking about pseudogenes, you can consider those sequences uh, such as the centromere. This is the portion of the chromosome where the cell microtubules attach to move chromosomes around. That's a specific sequence. Human chromosome 2 as a fusion has a functional centromere as you would expect, but it also has a centromere-like sequence that's been inactivated due to mutation in the exact syntonous area that you would predict it to be so based on comparison with human, or with uh, chimpanzee and gorilla chromosomes. Okay. Now, perhaps one might want to make the argument, this is sort of my anti-evolution interlocutor speaking throughout the different talk, and we'll speak to this in a bit. Perhaps, perhaps this isn't common descent that we're looking at. Perhaps there's some deeper underlying function that's being driven by this order of genes. I'll leave that as an open question. I don't believe there's good support for that, but it's certainly a question worth raising because it's likely the answer that's going to come back as you discuss these things. Okay, moving on to pseudogeny or pseudogenes. We've already seen sort of an example of this with that inactivated centromere that we see on chromosome 2, as well as the uh, telomere, the tip sequences are also present at the presumed fusion point as well. Okay, so what is exactly a pseudogene? Um, these are sometimes referred to simply as junk DNA. Um, we've, ha we've had a little bit of, a, of that um, from uh, Bruce Gordon's talk. But what I'm specifically going to be focusing on, there's sometimes a confusion between something junk, so-called junk DNA versus non-coding DNA. Well, non-coding DNA, of course, has tons of functions. Nobody's arguing against that, and it's, that's been known for a long, long time. What we're speaking of when we're speaking of pseudogenes is 
sequences that have clear signs of once having been a function.